What we'll do today is continue with our discussion of uh, learning Bayesian networks. Uh, this is uh, chapter 17, uh, one of two chapters we have uh, dedicated to the subject. And as we discussed last time, the principle here is that of maximum likelihood learning. Uh, what we've done last time is uh, discuss the um, learning of network parameters. We assume that we have a particular structure. And then we have a data set, could be complete or incomplete. And then we looked at how we estimate the parameters of the structure from the data in that particular case. Uh, what we'll do today is uh, look at the complementary problem when we do not have a structure. So we will learn both the structure and then the parameters as well. Uh, one of the main insights will be that if we just use the principle from last time, which is uh, the likelihood principle, that is uh, maximizing the probability of generating the data, uh, that will not be sufficient. We will actually need to do something more. Uh, but in fact, we will start with this initially. Uh, that is by assuming the structure is unknown, and um, we will do a restricted case of structure learning, where the principle for learning the structure will be still based on maximizing the probability of observing the given data set. And in that particular restricted case, this principle will make sense. Uh, but as we will see more generally, it will not. And then we have to augment it. Um, that is, we have to change or refine our objective function uh, when doing learning. Here's a concrete example. Uh, this is a particular data set here that is complete over uh, four variables, A, B, C, D. And uh, this is a particular uh, structure. And uh, the score of that particular structure is this. If you remember from last time, the log likelihood of a particular structure, uh, which we can view it as, as a score of that, is obtained by estimating the maximum likelihood parameters of the structure from this data set. Right? So there's many parameters I can put in here, but there is one set of them that will generate a distribution that maximizes the probability of this particular data set, right? These are the maximum likelihood parameters. So suppose you find them, and in fact, in this case, they happen to be this. If you take these parameters, plug them into the structure, in a sense, you get the best distribution you can get from the point of maximum likelihood. And then if you, care, if you go ahead and compute the probability of the data set, uh, under this distribution, and you take the log of that, you get this number here, okay? So this is what you can do assuming this particular structure. And the next slide show you a different structure, same data set. So we have here is A, B, C, D, uh, same data set, but now a different structure. Now, that has its own maximum likelihood parameters as well. So you can parameterize this in so many ways, but one of these ways maximize the probability of that particular data set, and it happens to be this one. If you take these parameters, plug them in here, you get a distribution, you compute the probability of the data set, take the log, get this one. So this is worse in this case. I, I think what we're trying to do here is, is visualize more uh, the score of a structure using the likelihood principle. And, and, and again, we're going to see that we will have to augment this notion of a score in a little bit. But just think of this single number that basically gives us the quality of a structure uh, given a data set. All right, so what we'll do is start by uh, discussing a well-known uh, famous algorithm uh, for learning tree structures. So now we're not trying to learn an arbitrary uh, DAG. Uh, we're assuming that we have actually a tree. So uh, we're assuming that the true model is a tree, and we want to learn that tree structure from data. And, and there is a, a well-known algorithm for this that actually has a quadratic complexity. And um, it is interesting on its own because people use it as a baseline in many things. The underlying uh, main result is also interesting to know. Uh, but then sometimes people use this algorithm to uh, generate an initial uh, structure to seed into other algorithms. And it's based on a, a simple uh, result. You remember the notion of a mutual information that we discussed before. So if you have two variables, let's say x and u, you can talk about the mutual information between them. Uh, you compute the mutual information with respect to a distribution, 
and it tells you kind of how tightly coupled those two variables are with, according to that distribution. So if mutual information is zero, then they're independent, and uh, as they become closely uh, dependent on each other, the mutual inf information goes up. This is definition is doing that, is computing the mutual information between two variables, but according to the empirical distribution, right? Anytime you compute mutual information, you need a distribution. In this case, we have a data set. And if you remember from last time, we talked about the notion of a distribution that's implied by a data set or what we call the empirical distribution. So here you're computing the mutual information according to the empirical distribution. That's the standard definition, except that the distribution is PR sub D. Okay, now. If we have this notion of a mutual information between two variables, then now we're going to generate a score for a tree structure. So you give me a tree structure G uh, that has these particular edges. U is the parent, X is the child. And remember, in a tree, every node has a single parent. What we're going to do is we're going to score the tree by adding up the scores of individual edges in the tree. And what's the score of an edge? Simply the mutual information between the parent and child. Here's the score of a tree, that's G. And what we're going to do is we're going to iterate over all edges in that tree. And then for each edge, we compute the mutual information between the node and its parent. And that's the score of the tree. So now I give you a tree. I give you a data set. You know how to score it. Well, here's the interesting result. If you find a tree that maximizes that particular score, then it happens to be also a tree that, ma that has a maximum likelihood. This is the score we talked about, which simply, you know, looked at a tree and add up the mutual information between every node and its parent, and this is the log likelihood uh, that we looked at. It's basically the same. So now this gives you an algorithm for trying to find the structure that maximizes the property of the data, or a maximum likelihood tree structure. How do we do that? Straightforward algorithm is, here are the variables. I have A, B, C, D. In principle, any of them could be connected by an edge in the final structure. So what I do is, for every possible edge, I put the score. What's that score? Mutual information. How do I get that? From the data set. These numbers on these edges basically represent the mutual information scores. What do I need to do? I just need to find maximum spanning tree. I need to find a tree structure where if I add up the scores of every edge in the tree, I get the maximal value, right? That's standard algorithms from uh, theory. As you can imagine, you may have multiple uh, spanning trees to start with. And moreover, let's say this happens to be a maximum spanning tree. That's undirected. If I want to make it into a Bayesian network, I can do it in so many different ways, right? If, if I want to turn this into a directed tree, I just have to choose what we call a root and then direct edges away from that node. So in this case, I chose B to be the root. And then look what happened. From B to Z, that's the edge. From B to D, that's the edge. From C to A, that's the edge. So I get this tree structure. But I could have done it this way. In this case, I chose A as the root. And then I'm directing edges away from A. So from A to C, from C to B, from B to D, and now that's what I have. So I have this and I have that. Either of them is just equally good. Okay, so this is the tree learning algorithm. And as, as you can see, now you, you get the quadratic hit because of this, right? You are looking at every pair. Uh, maximum spanning algorithms, you know, have better complexity than n squared, but you're starting with, with a graph uh, of that particular size. And as I said, this is a well-known, uh, famous algorithm that uh, is used both as a baseline in experiments and also uh, it's used to generate structures that seed other algorithms. Let me show you one more thing about this algorithm, uh, which will tie it to a result we did last time. And again, will help us with the transition to the more general uh, approach for uh, structure learning. If, if I give you one of these three structures that I found, I hand it to you, and then I hand you also the data set, and I tell you, find the score of that particular uh, tree or, or the uh, log likelihood. So the, the standard way of doing this, of computing the log likelihood, is you compute the probability of each case in the data, correct? 
right? You take the, the, the tree, you find the maximum likelihood parameters, you plug them in, and then you go to the data set and, and look at every case and compute its probability and take the product. That's the uh, uh, standard definition. But we can do the same using a result from last time. Remember last time we showed a formula for the log likelihood of a particular structure given a data set. Uh, what we said is that that log likelihood decomposes into a bunch of quantities where each quantity is computed with respect to a family. Uh, I don't have the, the actual equation, but when you plug it in for uh, our tree structure here, uh, that is in C. Let's look at C again. What is C? This is C. Look what I have here. I have these guys. Um, so A has its parent as C, C has its parent at B. B has no parents, and D has B as the parent, right? So try to uh, kind of remember these families. And what this result says, uh, that the log likelihood is this. What is what's going on here? N is the size of the data set. And then what I'm doing is doing an entropy computation for each family, right? Every variable given its parent. So A given its parent C. Uh, B is the roots, C given its parent D, and D given its parent D. So these are the families in the tree structure. In general, they're the families in the uh, DAC structure. And I'm doing the conditional entropy. What's the entropy on A given C? What's the entropy on B? What's the entropy on C given B? What's the entropy on D given B? And again, this is all empirical entropy, right? Computed with respect to the empirical distribution. Each one of these quantities is based on a family. I just put them together, what do I get? I get that same guy, right? And that's the computation, that's the score for this particular tree. Again, this formula, as I said, plays many roles, one of them computational, but now we're going to utilize it to observe the following phenomena. The phenomena being why maxima ma maximizing uh, likelihood uh, is not a good idea in general, right, when learning structure. So, here's the tree structure. This is what we've done so far. We assume that the structure is a tree and we try to learn it. Here, a DAG, which was obtained from this guy by simply adding a single edge. Now, remember what happened here. How many families were changed when moving from this to that? Only one. That's A. It used to have one parent. Now it has two parents. Okay, bookmark this observation. And now we even have what we call a, a more or a denser DAG. In fact, we took this guy, added even more edges, we got that. Not only is this DAG more connected than this, this is what we call a complete DAG. What does that mean? You can't add any more edges to it. If you add any more edge, you get cycles, right? So that's as connected as it can in, in a sense. Once more, as we're going from this guy this way, what we're doing is we are changing families by increasing the number of their parents. Looking at a variable and adding more parents. Okay, look at the significance of this observation. I want to contrast the score of this guy with the score of that. Uh, in particular, the log likelihood. What's the log likelihood of this guy versus the log likelihood of that guy? Okay, and I'm going to do it using the formula that we used before. This is the formula where we looked at the entropies of each family, right? Conditional entropy of a variable given its parent. This is now the score of this guy, right, as a compared to that. This was about 12, minus 12. Now look at this um, guy now. It's a better score, right? What happened? If you look at this formula, all its members are the same except for this guy. Because when I went from the tree to the DAG, what did I do? I added one edge. I changed the family for A, correct? Let's look at it again. A had only C as the parent, now it has C and B. So in the first case, I computed the entropy of A given C, now I'm computing the entropy of A given C and D. And that's what happened here. So only this terms changed its value, and that's what I got, and actually it's a better score, okay? Now look at the following. What happened here, the fact that I got a better score, is not surprising for the following reason. If you look at this entropy, it's smaller, it's smaller than that. This is A given CD, this is A given C. 
and because of that you negate that that this is what's causing the fact that we got a better score uh, for the DAG. But the more general principle is this. If you have these two parent sets and U star is bigger, right? Or at least no, no smaller, so it contains U. Look what happens here. Look what happens to the entropy. So the entropy of X given U compared to the entropy of X given U star. You have this relation. By adding parents, the entropy can only get smaller. What does that tell you? You cannot worsen the likelihood. In fact, by adding parents, you can only, in principle, the, the, the likelihood will look likelihood will either stay the same or get better. What does that tell you? By adding edges, that's what happens when you add an edge. When you add an edge, you just increase the number of parents per node, correct? What are you doing? You will only be, you, you cannot worsen the like, log likelihood. Implication? This. If you have a DAG, G star, which is the result of adding edges to this DAG, then you will only uh, be keeping the log likelihood or improving it. You cannot worsen it. And what this means is if you use the log likelihood as the principle, as the sole principle for searching for structure, what will you end up doing? You'll end up basically learning complete DAGs. And that, as you'll see, is problematic on many counts. Remember, a complete, complete DAG is one where you could not uh, add more edges to it. Otherwise, you will get cycles, directed cycles. And um, you can think of uh, these complete DAGs there is n factorial of them. You have n variables. Uh, the reason you get this is you can get a complete DAG by uh, assuming a total ordering on the variables, right? x1 through xn. And then you take each variable and make all of the preceding ones the parents. So if you have an x5, then you make x1 through x4 all parents of x5. This is one way of synthesizing all complete DAGs. Okay. If you just use the uh, likelihood principle, then you'll end up basically fav favoring more connected DAGs. It's problematic for a number of reasons. These kind of DAGs make no assertions of conditional independence. Uh, they're not interesting. They don't tell us much about the properties of the distribution they induce. Uh, like a DAG, a complete DAG over n variables has three width of n minus one. Uh, that's problematic for inference, but more generally, from a learning point of view, uh, what people say is that uh, in this case you will suffer from a problem known as overfitting, uh, which refers to the use of a model that has too many parameters compared to the available data. Okay, that's at a high level, but we'll see now what that means uh, a little bit more intuitively. Let's illustrate this maybe a concept from a principle that or a phenomena that you're more familiar with. What we're doing here is trying to find a polynomial uh, that fits a given set of data points, right? Uh, uh, so we're trying to find a function y of x. Here's the data points x, y, da, da, da. And, and look at this. So this is the x, y pair. So we have uh, here's x, y, x, y, da, 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 and so on. So that's what we have. Now, if you visually look at this, it looks like it's a linear function. That's, that's what it looks like. And in fact, if you try to you know, use that, then this would be your function. And uh, it has two parameters, right, a and b. So you try to estimate a and b and uh, generate a linear function that kind of fits the data. It's not going to be a perfect fit because that's not exactly linear here, right? Now, if you insist on a perfect fit, though, you can do that but you need to use a higher order polynomial. In fact, if you use a fourth degree polynomial, you can get a perfect fit for this data set. That's what's happening here. So that's a perfect fit. That's not a perfect fit. What's the problem here? Doesn't kind of generalize the data. So it's not as good as this guy for predicting values of y for given x's that are not in the data set. That is the, the problem overfitting in a nutshell. If you just try to optimize 
the log likelihood and leave put no constraint on the structure of the Bayesian network, you're effectively trying to find the best fit that you can to the data. And that's not necessarily good. As we've seen here, you will fit the data well, but you will not be able to generalize. It's an old, uh, very old problem in science. There's no unique solution to this problem, but basically, you can think of all available solutions to be based on this principle that's known as Occam's razor, which says that uh, one should prefer simpler models over more complex models, other things being equal. That's, that's kind of the uh, uh, general principle. And, and to play this particular game, then you need to have a notion of model complexity. And that notion tend to exist for different kind of models. And for Bayesian networks, we'll see is what you would expect. Uh, the uh, model complexity is measured using the number of independent parameters. And, and we know what that is. So we'll, we'll take just a concrete example of that, and then we will see how that now gets used to obtain a more refined score to use when trying to learn structure. This is the notion of model complexity. OK, there is a notation because we have to write a formula, but it's straightforward. You know what this is. Uh, you have a particular DAG, here are the variables, and for each variable xi, the, the corresponding parent is u sub i. We're going to use this uh, sharp notation to denote the number of instantiations. So uh, y is a set of variables, you write this to mean the number of instantiations it has. And then the dimension of the DAG is defined just as follows, right? So this is the dimension of the whole DAG. Uh, you add the dimensions of the families, right? So it iterate over the families and compute this, and what is that? Uh, that's basically the number of independent parameters for the CPT of XI. You know what that is. You have to look at every instantiation of the parents and every instanti number of instantiations for XI minus one, right? Because uh, that's basically it, right? Straightforward. Uh, there is really no nothing in you here except for notation. If you look at these DAGs and you do the dimensions, that's what you find, right? So. How many dependent parameters for this guy? Just one. This guy, two. And two here, and two there. That's seven, and so on. This guy has nine, and this guy has 15. OK, so uh, we have this, and now we're going to go to utilizing this to improve our uh, score. We'll be talking about a family of scoring functions. They will basically have the following structure, right? So what are we trying to do here? Find the score of a particular DAG with respect to a data set. We know what this is. That's the log likelihood. Okay? That's the fit to data. Now, what are we adding here? This is the new thing. What we're adding is the dimension and something that is known as basically, this whole thing is known as the penalty uh, term. So this is log likelihood. We know that. This is the penalty term that is meant to favor simpler models ones with a smaller number of independent parameters. The penalty term uh, has this weight. So this is the weight of the penalty term, and it's a function of the data set size. Okay, let's again look at it again. This guy tries to optimize for fit. This guy tries to penalize for complexity. They work against each other in a sense, right? This guy prefers to have more parameters, more free parameters. Uh, to improve the fit, and this guy says, no, don't go too far in including free parameters. There is, this is a family. Why is it a family? Because this guy is not specified. The, the weight is not specified yet. All we know about the weight is it is a function of, or could be a function of the uh, size of the data set. Okay, now we'll take a couple of examples of what that weight can be, and that gives you a couple of well-known scoring functions we're learning the structure. So before I tell you more about this um, penalty term or the penalty weight and the implications. You have to now uh, remember the following distinction. At this level that we discussed it, it doesn't matter uh, what specific instance of this we use from a computational point of view, in the sense that the approach we're going to talk about learning structure or learning structures that optimize this particular score will basically look the same and they're basically do not care 
about this guy. You'll see now, we'll make some observations about this uh, and how it can decompose, and they'll exploit that. So from a computational point of view, it doesn't matter what's going to happen here. But from a statistical point of view, it does. When you're looking at what kind of a model am I learning, now we're going to see at least two distinctions, and you'll see the implications of that. So there is those dimensions of what kind of a model I'm learning, does it make sense, it, it is doing the right thing, and there is the computational complexity, and they're kind of orthogonal in a, in a sense. All right, so let's take a further peek at the scoring function. One possibility is for this guy to just be a constant, a constant that is independent of n, that is, does not depend on the size of the data set. If I have a penalty term, but that penalty term doesn't depend on how much data I have. This term, the log likelihood, grows linearly in the size of the data set. So if, you, if this guy is a constant, what will happen is this term will dominate the penalty term. And the model complexity will end up only being used to this kind of to distinguish between models that have relatively equal likelihood terms. This is scoring function is basically known as the uh, Akaki information criteria or AIC. The more common and influential uh, version of the scoring function though is what we're going to do next. It's known as the MDL score or the minimum description length but you get this by adopting this particular penalty weight. What happens here is this. You're the log of n, where n is the size of the data set. Now, I'm, I'm just going to make observation on this now. Why did we do log 2 of n over 2 and, and, and versus other things? There are justifications of this particular scoring metric. Actually, there is a lot of uh, material on it and various derivations on it from various angles. We're not going to get into this. We're just going to make a couple of observations about its behavior and focus more on, on computationally, on optimizing it. But basically what happens here is if you take this guy and plug it into our template, then, as I said, you get this, which is known as the MDL score. This penalty net now term will grow logarithmically in N, while, as we mentioned before, the log likelihood term grows linearly in N. So what does that mean? What's going to happen as N grows? The penalty term becomes less influential. So in a sense, if you have too many data, too much data, then I basically start optimizing or only optimizing for likelihood. And in a sense, this notion of a penalty or trying to control how many free parameters is more of an issue when I don't have enough data, which makes sense intuitively, right? I mean, this, when I showed you this problem of uh, uh, you know, linear function versus fourth degree polynomial, try to visualize it. It was more of an issue because I didn't have too many data points. But if I had a lot of data points, then doing it, going more for a perfect fit would not be problematic, right? And that's basically what's going on here. Uh, and it is known, you will see in, when you read papers on the subject, uh, you'll always see statements like, uh, so because we don't have enough data, we are prone to the subject of uh, problem of overfitting, right? It, it, overfitting becomes more of a problem. Um, when, when you don't have uh, enough data. Okay, folks, so uh, we have this scoring function that has these two components. Uh, one of the two components uh, can be filled in a number of different ways. And let's make a few more observations uh, on this before we move further. First of all, is an example that we looked at before. Uh, this is a tree structure, and this is a DAX structure that we obtained by simply adding an edge. You've seen that when we looked at it from the uh, likelihood point of view, this was better than that. And if you look at the MDL score, uh, that's the likelihood term, and that's the penalty. Uh, once more, look, when you look at likelihood, this guy is better. Now, when you integrate the second part, which is the penalty term, what happens? We end up favoring, actually, this guy when you put the two things together. 
right? So MDL prefers superstructure even though it has smaller log likelihood. Uh, this score, by the way, is also known as the Bayesian information criteria, and sometimes people negate it. All right. So what, what we've done so far is settled the major question of what is the objective function we should be optimizing when we're learning the structure, right? And the, the, the key thing here was uh, making this distinction between fit and complexity and uh, what we will be doing uh, in the second segment is looking at algorithms for optimizing that score, right? And we're going to see that we basically have about three or four uh, general techniques that we can use for this purpose. And uh, we will try to make the uh, discussion there relatively intuitive and abstract without getting into the details because a lot of the details are standard uh, from other courses. Uh, but let me do this. Let's actually take um, our 10-minute break now and, and start this as a new segment.